I'd like to uh, now introduce our speakers for the event today, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, featuring Zakha Nawaz and Anita Majumdar. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors and partners for the event, SFU Woodwards, Geist Magazine, Jigni Style, The Writers' Festival, the Center for Comparative Study of Muslim Societies and Cultures, and South Asian Arts. It is now my pleasure to introduce a very good friend of mine who I've had the opportunity of working with and interviewing and having many long talks over Skype with. Um, Anita Majumdar is an award-winning actor and playwright. She has written a number of fantastic plays that have um, gone on to be featured across the country, including Fish Eyes, The Misfit, um, and a new play, Same, Same, But Different, which will uh, be part of the Push Festival in January, so keep your eyes out for that one. Um, she was also recently seen in Midnight's Children, where she was fantastic, and uh, you're in for a real treat with uh, Nita Majumdar, so I would like to now welcome her to the stage. Thanks. Uh, it is always so fantastic for me to come back to my hometown in, of Vancouver. And uh, this is particularly special for me because uh, Zarka is a bit of a hero to me. Uh, I think if, if you were to define the word pioneer, uh, Zarka's face would be right next to the uh, definition in the, in the dictionary. Uh, Zarka has paved the way for so many uh, creators and writers of color across this country. Uh, uh, what some may term her work as being controversial, others would term as uh, being severely brave. Uh, and, and all because it's insanely funny. Uh, we're here today uh, to actually talk to Zarka about her new uh, creation, her newest creation, uh, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, uh, which she's been working on for two years. Uh, we're, we're, we're mostly familiar with Zarka's work uh, from Little Mosque on the Prairie. Uh, she's the creator of, of the, the, the show that ran for six seasons on the CBC. Uh, but uh, Zarka also has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, uh, as well as her Bachelor of Journalism from Ryerson. Uh, she claims that she was bored of journalism and uh, then found her way into filmmaking uh, and has had two works premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, if that isn't enough, uh, she's now written this book uh, and has four children. So hopefully in the next hour, we're going to learn how Zeka does all of this and puts us all to shame. So please put your hands together and uh, help me welcome Zaka Nawaz. Thank you. Can, can, can everyone hear me? We, I think we're supposed to use supposed these. To use the mics. Okay. Uh, so is that better? Is, that, is this? Is, okay. Can everyone hear us? Uh, I, I feel like you've been doing the festival or the, uh, the, the, book, the book circuit for some time, so uh, I, I kind of want to put some disclaimers out. What, what this talk will not be is, so why are Muslims, how do Muslims, are you Muslim? Thank you, yes, so, I am. So <laughs> uh, we're going to just skip that uh, for today's talk. Um, I would actually like to start... Uh, because I, I feel like this is like our first date. We've we've actually never met. We we know about each other's work, uh, but uh, this is my first chance to sort of nail you down and ask all my questions. Uh, so I'm going to actually start on a slightly antagonistic uh, sure. uh, note. So uh, in in the book, uh, I which I I loved reading it was Thank insanely you. funny. Congratulations! Thank you very much. Uh, you you term a moment. Uh, that you carry for 20 years, the humiliation of this moment is, uh, it weighs so heavily on you until you confront it with the person who is, who is involved. Uh, I would like to now do that with you. So, uh, I don't have a lot of regrets in my career, but I have one. Uh, I auditioned for Little Mosque on the Prairie three <laughs> times. Because you guys casted someone, 
Uh, and then that person wasn't any good. And then you cast it someone else, and something happened. And so I kept, they kept calling me in. Uh, and I, and, then, <laughs> and I, every time I thought, this is my chance. This is, it's gonna be me. Uh, and even, I think I tried my very, very humiliating attempt to put on a hijab. That's probably what lost the part. But I, I remember what it was, and I remember thinking, I'm not white enough. Like, there's no way I could be the daughter of Carlo Rhoda and Sheila McCarthy. Uh, and, but his being my greatest lament and my mother, who is sitting in the audience, uh, they're, they're huge fans of the show. Uh, how, how does it feel to have, you know, I mean, it's been a while since Little Mosque uh, was off the air. How does it feel to have people still come up to you and tell you their story of Little Mosque and what it meant to them and their own personal anecdote? You were robbed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I actually did not know that, that you were in the running for Ryan. I had no idea. Satara Hewitt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She would have made a brilliant Ryan. She would have been lovely. I thought maybe it was because I didn't look good in a hijab. Like, you have to have a, I mean, you have a fantastic face oh, for it. Oh, thank so you, thank you. I, also... I never saw any of the tapes that came. <laughs> I only ever saw hers. And, and, um, and she, I think the only gig she had was You Bet Your Ass. Do you remember that show? It was a yes. game show. <laughs> and she had never acted Well, anything. I stalked her after I found out she got the show. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to see Actually, who, you who my little, nemesis You look was. a little bit like her. <laughs> well, <laughs> Now that you, you mentioned it. <laughs> uh, but I, I, it, I think this is actually a, a veiled compliment is where I'm going with this, uh, is that Little Mosque changed Canadian television. Uh, was that something that, you know, people ask me this sometimes, and probably not as much as you, uh, you know, did you set out to uh, set a new standard, to, to raise the bar? Uh, you know, when you were writing Little Mosque, and from what I understand was, you know, the, the transition point was... Uh, Me in the Mosque, uh, which was the CBC documentary, uh, which was less funny yes. uh, than, say, Little Mosque on the Prairie. So, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile yourself with uh, knowing that you actually changed it's, Canadian television? Well, it's funny because you didn't, you, nobody, nobody knew, right? Nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody knew it was going to be successful. Um, I was surprised that they accepted the pitch, to be honest with you, because let's face it, like, I remember um, being in the entertainment industry and all I would ever hear is, well, Canadians just can't make sitcoms. It's just a thing. We just can't do it. Uh, we've tried, but we just it's not possible. And you would always hear these excuses, and I, and I would always ask why. And they go, well, it's because we, we just haven't, you know, the Americans are this juggernaut, and it's not, we can't, you know, all the eyes are on them, and it's hard to get Canadians to watch Canadian shows. And so literally we didn't, there was King of Kensington, which was, like 25 years ago, and then nothing, like literally nothing that was, you know, where you could say that was significant. And then, then, you, then suddenly Corner Gas appeared in the horizon in Saskatchewan, which suddenly got, got a lot of attention and ratings and numbers. And by the time I had pitched Little Moss, that show was already on the air. And I remember the pitch was about, you know, a Muslim community in a little broken mosque, in a kind of abandoned church in the middle of the prairies, um, in a little town in the middle of nowhere, and that was the pitch, and it wouldn't scream rating success to anybody, really. Like, that was the last show on earth anyone would say, yes, that's the one that's going to save the CBC, right? <laughs> right? And, and so it was to my surprise that the CBC took it so seriously. Like, and I asked Anton Leo, who was the head of comedy, like, why on earth did you take that pitch seriously? And he said, because I was the son of Italian immigrants. Mm -hmm. And the story of Im you know, immigrants coming to Canada and what, it, what their experiences trying to fit into the culture and the community and the fears associated with from the wider community. It goes, the stories just resonated with him, and he was Italian. And I should have realized at that point, if he was Italian and he, was, and he felt that the Muslim story resonated for him, what it, was, what, what it meant was it was a universal story of, of newcomers coming to a new country and trying to fit in and forge their identity, like fuse the Canadian identity with the immigrant identity, whatever, you know, faith or ethnic group it was, and that somehow resonated with people of all faiths, of all faith communities. And so even though I, in my mind it was a very specific show of a very specific ethnic and religious community, it ended up being a universal show that appealed to a very broad audience. 
Uh, a very, uh, another very dear friend of mine is here in the audience, uh, Shahrazad Cooper, uh, who I remember uh, she and I had a, an incredible conversation where we were, we were, we were talking about the nature of work, uh, the, the way we write stories, and that this, this term uh, that drives the both of us insane, which is the term universality that what we're trying to achieve all the time is some kind of general wash where everyone can understand, uh, and, and that, that that term is in itself quite vague. But that uh, she had read somewhere that actually the way to uh, actually achieve universality is to be very specific. Mm, uh, that we, we uh, often as storytellers and writers, uh, we, we get very afraid of, of getting too specific, getting too ethnically specific, because then how will we reach a broader audience? But Little Mosque is such a testament to when you, uh, when you decide to be very specific, uh, and, uh, and I'd love to know how autobiographical Little Mosque actually is, but when you talk about something that you know, uh, that is, is you know, wrought in nuance, wrought in actual specifics, that it actually has mass appeal. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating because I, I never knew that until I made the show. Mm. And, I and I was really honestly surprised when someone from the synagogue or someone from the church would say to me, oh my God, I recognize Bobber. That we have a bobber. And I'm like, really? Because <laughs> you feel that you are the weirdo, right? No one can be as weird as your group of people. Like, like nobody can beat us. Like, we are at the top, the echelon of weirdness. And, and then people come up to you going, oh my God, you know, that's like, uh, that happened in my church. And you're like, really? Like, you have people like that? And that, you know, it was kind of, it made you feel better about being a human <laughs> because you're realizing it's not just Muslims that are the strange ones. Like everybody else has that sort of those dynamics in their own community. Well, it's, it's also a point of cohesion. So it it allows it allows for a bonding that wasn't necessarily intended when you wrote it because you were writing something so specific. Uh, so I'll, I'll revert back to my previous question: How how autobiographical is uh, Little Moss? Well, when I first started, because you know in our in my generation, I'm much older than you. Um, being going into medicine, going into engineering, where that was the career our parents wanted us to go to, because they had just you know left countries and situations that had been difficult, and they wanted economic stability for their kids, and so they you know there wasn't a lot of risk taking. My parents still want that. Yeah. I'm just gonna let you know. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes they're I, really <laughs> still hoping that I will become an engineer. You know what? I asked my kids to apply to medical school. When they, t <laughs> I, I hate to say this, after everything I've been through, I'm doing the same thing <laughs> because. As an artist, you realize how hard it is as an artist. That's what I find. And now I'm like, you don't want to go through this. Maybe you should apply to medical school. And all they're like, you're such a hypocrite. You're just like nanny. <laughs> all the actor parents that I know are, are dedicated to making sure their children never, ever, ever. become actors or artists. <laughs> ever, ever, I know. Ever. It's horrible. I, I, I feel horrible. <laughs> but it's just, yeah, as a parent, I, could now, I can now understand why my parents were pushing. Because they were trying to avoid you know, the heartache and, and the hardship that they went through. And so w when I started the Lamas, we didn't have, you know, uh, Muslims who were writers or really any ethnic group that were writers in that, in the sitcom. First of all, we didn't have sitcoms in Canada, so we hadn't trained a group of sitcom writers. So it was, it was, it was hard. It wasn't a very shallow pool to pick from. So it was me and a bunch of white guys. And so we were doing a show about a mosque, which they hadn't, you know, never darkened the door <laughs> of a mosque. So it had to be, they were drawing a lot from my experiences. And then gradually, um, you know, I hired Sadia Durrani, who was a stand-up comedian from Winnipeg. It's one of our writers. And we had other people come in so that they could watch the set, and I wouldn't have to be at the set and at the writing room. Because it, it was hard being sort of torn apart between what the actors were doing and in the writing room. And then my family was in Saskatchewan, and I was That's flying. I was going to say. Yeah, you were flying, from I was that. separated from them, and I was flying back and forth. Um, because the show originally was supposed to be set in Saskatchewan. Well, it was set in Saskatchewan, but also supposed to be shot in Saskatchewan. But then it got moved to Toronto. It became a big political decision because no one thought it was going to be that successful. And then the, the CBC execs were like, we want to really you know, nurture the show in Toronto. And then suddenly it's like, wait, wait, but my family, my kids live in Regina. So that became this thing where you had to shoot in Toronto, be there for you know, Monday to Friday, and then come home on the weekend and kind of go back and forth for months. And it was this exhausting thing. But I couldn't not go because there was no one to replace me. There was like, yeah. I mean, now, thank God, you know, you're seeing many more people from, you know, 
ethnic communities coming up into the arts, but back then it was very few and it was hard. Even the actoring was hard to find people. Of course. So, um, what do you think it is about um, about comedy? What is it about comedy that you think actually helps tell your stories better? You know, that's always a question that I feel like it's hard to answer because I, I don't know, I, I should ask you that question. Because <laughs> do you feel that if you analyze what you do too closely, it'll jinx the works? Do you I, feel, because I feel like if I, because people go, well, where does it come from? How do you do it? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to think about it too much because if I do, yeah. then I'll, it'll come apart. It'll unravel because it's, it's this kind of magic that you can find and you have to work. I mean, it's like a muscle. You have to work at it, work at it, work at it to get better at it right. and to hone your craft. But to think about it too closely, I leave to the academics mm. and the people who do their PhDs and to sort it out because I feel like and if I... And I guess I, the critics. The critics. Like to allow them to um, dissect the thing that... That, that, that makes things intuitive. funny. How do you, yeah, how do you, how do you explain it? I don't know how it's, to explain it. It's funny because um, I've had to write a number of grants uh, explaining my work, and it's the only time I've analyzed my own work. And and the thing that you're trying to do in a grant is uh, say, hey, this is what I do that's so unique, and I'm changing the landscape of Canada, and give me money. Uh, so you're <laughs> sort of, you're, you're, you're trying to talk about yourself as though you're reviewing your own work, but it has no negatives. Uh, but uh, when I think about uh, taking, taking comedy... Um, the thing that I find I'm the most questioned about is, but you're like a brown girl. How can you be funny? One of the the biggest uh, biggest hurdles has been like, oh, you know, when I saw you in that Indian dance costume, I didn't know you were going to be funny. What is it about this sort of uh, the I guess the the expectations that we have with uh, the perception of the South Asian woman? That, that we suddenly stamp and say, oh, I've already made a decision about you. You are, you are going to follow this uh, sort of narrow margin that's been fed to me by, by a certain kind of media. Um, why, why is it so shocking that that, that funny, woman can be that funny, can be funny and I know, can be a funny writer? I remember, I remember thinking sometimes, especially when I was in a room full of got man, male writers, and I would come up with a joke and it, they would look at me like I discovered pl plutonium, right? <laughs> like, did she say that? Did that come out of her mouth? <laughs> and it would be like, but like, you know, you suddenly realize that they weren't expecting me to be as funny as them or that I could, you know, I could pitch just as well as they could. And you realize that, you know, there's a lot of sexism in the comedy world, mm. you know, but, you know, we, we're lucky we're growing, we're, you know, Tina, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, you know, Melissa McCarthy, like they're coming up and they're proving that, you know, women can be just as funny as men and they can helm projects like Bridesmaids, um, Heat, you know, Sandra Bullock, that great film with Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy, and they, they could be bestsellers and, and they can do really well and that women could be just as funny as men and have their projects, you know, be just as successful as male projects. So it's like a double thing. It's a gender thing and then it's a race yeah, thing. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like it. with us, then it's, it's not just that we're women. It's like, oh, woman of color. And it's like this... Like this, this giant, and anchor. you have to prove yourself. You have to prove, and that's why I, like, and sometimes you feel like you're not as good as. And so when the reviews of the books, the book came out, and they were like, "It's so funny," and it was like, "Really? You think so?" And I, and I remember, like, why am I questioning my abilities, right? Because, like, it makes you, you know, self doubt, and you're always wondering, "Am I as good as?" And you're like, "Yeah, I should." own it. I am as good as, and it did make people feel funny. And, and because we were writing Little Mosque in a team of like seven to nine writers and we're all pitching and, um, and, and, and it makes you feel insecure. You're like, did my joke get through? Was I as funny as that guy? Um, and so, you know, it, it feeds that insecurity. And so when I, when the book came out uh, and I was asking my editor, maybe we should hire a group of seven to nine writers. <laughs> they can punch up the book. And she's like, no, that's not how publishing works. <laughs> it's like, you're the writer. Your, your name is the only name on this book and it's going to be you. And that's all there is to it. And I'm like, but then that'll be, that'll be it. That'll just, I'll be exposed as, you know, whatever talent I have, it will be in there. And, and oh my God, what will happen? <laughs> and so it, literally I was really, really worried. Like, what if it's not funny? What, what will that say about and me? And that insecurity just ask. kills like, you. Does that, um, do you feel that pressure? Oh, yeah. Like, because you're insanely funny. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you have six so seasons you. behind you. But do you feel, because I know I feel that. Uh, I remember when I was writing The Misfit, uh, it just wasn't happening. Like, I was trying to write joke after joke, and it was just, it was so forced, and it was uh, the, the freak out 
of feeling like, oh no, this is my thing. No one else, is, no one's gonna come see this. Uh, there aren't some good jokes. Um, do you, do you at a certain point find a way to release the pressure of of being funny and just write, or do you, do you find a way to just to move through it and and go to that special place where the jokes are? <laughs> I think it helps being really neurotic because you feed off that. You know, I mean, you think about the people who are funny, right? Woody Allen, like, you, and they're very neurotic, and I think it helps to be worried and to be anxious because then you then you can write about that anxiety and that worry and then try to spin it somehow into comedy. And being Muslim, especially in this day and age, <laughs> makes you very neurotic, <laughs> right? Because every time you turn on the TV, you're like, oh my God, like it just doesn't end, right? You know, the crazy stories, and you're just like, you have to turn it off and just, and try to breathe and say, it'll be okay and calm down. And you know, you've done speeches before, people laughed, everything will be fine. At, 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 what is the worst thing that will happen if people don't laugh? That's not the worst thing. No one's going to kill you. No one, there's not a mob with torches and they're not following you around. Like, it's okay. I was expecting jokes. Yeah. yeah. They're not going to run to your home and, you know, <laughs> demand a refund. It's fine. <laughs> right? You have to just remember that it's okay. Right? People will yeah. be okay because with at, it. At They'll the end of the day, you. it's yeah. actually, this is recreational that this is actually entertainment. This is what you do in your off hours. I mean, this is what we do on our on hours, but uh, that for other people, they're, they actually have no expectation. That's, that's what I have to remember. Uh, and, I, and I remember really, really early in my career where I, I would, I still get nervous, but I, I would get really nervous because there's no way to explain what it was I did. And to sell people on, you know, trying to produce it or just try to show a little excerpt of it. Uh, how do you describe this thing? And, uh, and then you sell yourself and you <laughs> use jazz hands. And then you, you do the thing and you hope that you haven't oversold it. And so I guess my, my other question to you is, how, what, what is your relationship with criticism? What do you, do you find it fuels you in the way that you were talking about in terms of the pressure really um, propelling the work? Uh, where where does criticism in the way of reviews, but in the way of you know um, Joe Schmo coming up to you and telling telling you their Criti two cents? Crit I mean, criticism it's good in a way because it it tells you what you could improve, but then at a certain point, especially with because now we live in the digital media age where people can criticize you anonymously, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's no um, answering back. There's no, can you come back and answer this person or make them accountable for what they said? So I noticed like if there'll be, there'll be a review of the show or you, you'll notice that there'll be like these horrific, she might be funny, but she belongs to a homicidal religion that kills people, right? And you're like, wait, wait, <laughs> why are we talking about that? Why do we have to go that, to that dark place, right? And it happens all the time. Like every, every article that comes out about me because I'm Muslim, there'll be the, the commentary at the end. But, 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 you know, her people and her religion and her this. And just because she's funny, does she think that she can wipe that all out? And you're like, at a certain point, you're like, okay, I have to not read that stuff all the time because it's, it, it's, it's, it's soul destroying, right? And then I, I'd sort of, like you're saying, how does your mind work? And then I sort of internalize it. And now when people say that to me, I'm like, yeah. or I read that and I say to a rep reporter, I know what's going to happen when this article comes out. There's going to be like 100 comments about her homicidal religion and how, you know, all she really, you know, she's just making this religion palatable so ultimately her people can wipe out the human race. And, <laughs> and you know, and I said, well, you know, the truth is, we don't really don't have time to take over Western civilization because we're too busy trying to keep Revenue Canada off our backs, right? <laughs> getting the kid to soccer practice, you know, so taking out the Western civilization, it's just a bit, you know, too complicated right now. So that was my way of dealing with it, right? Like I would deal with it in comedy, like just the mundane, like you're so worried about the mundane, like getting to... So you like, actually use this, used comedy used in your own to, life to, to deal with To cope with, with that the... negativity that was coming out with the reviews, the, not the reviews of the book, but the commentary underneath the reviews, right? Right. And uh, that was the only way for, that I realized that part of comedy is a coping mechanism so that you can digest all that negativity and turn it on its head and make it more positive. Right. Um, it's, I was watching one of your, uh, one of your interviews with, um, for the book, I, I think it was Canada AM, and um, you, know, you had said that uh, you know, criticism, um, criticism about religion is, is hard because, you know, like, the faith doesn't just belong to you. Uh, that, you know, you can, if, if someone doesn't think the, the show is funny or the book is funny, like, you know, they're entitled to their opinion. And I was really struck by that comment because 
criticism uh, from a religious standpoint is one thing, but also artistic criticism. Like, do, do you put those two points of criticism in, in two separate sections, in two separate categories, or uh, does one hurt more than the other? I think it, you know what, it's interesting because when people, like, I mean, I, a lot of conservative Muslims had a lot of trouble with the show, and some still do, because they feel that I had um, given a bad impression of Islam through the show. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm like, I think the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, maybe <laughs> they give a bad impression of Islam. <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't know think? how the show is really doing that. Like, I can never, they're like, yeah, but you know, like, Halloween, we shouldn't be... <laughs> You're encouraging kids to go to Halloween. I'm like, I think you're missing the big picture, right? If that's what you're worried about. And I have to not let that get to me because I'm realizing they're coming from a certain perspective. But it's also easy, right? That it's easier to uh, pinpoint the blame on this this lovely South Asian woman who's funny uh, than it is to take on the Taliban or to take <laughs> on the Al-Qaeda. You know what I mean? Like, You're more accessible. Find, yeah. yeah, it's like, hey, I can't talk to them, but I can talk to you. How dare you do this to Islam? Yeah. yeah. So I got that, and I, uh, it took a long time to understand where on earth that was coming from. You know, like, what are you talking about? And I think you know, obviously you have to take into consideration their background, their cultural background. It's a different sensibility than, like if I, you know, I obviously can't make uh, a comedy about 9-11, say. I mean, that would really upset. And you try. And I did try, <laughs> yes, but it's never going to happen because that's a sensitive subject for Americans, right? So then you have to understand even people that you grow up with or in the same culture as you have certain sensitivities about certain issues and you can't cross certain barriers. They're just, they're not going to let you that it's just, you know, we, we, it's, it's true what we say we live in a society where you have freedom of speech, but still there are places that people will not tr- let you tread or not, will not want to go there in a comedic manner because it's too sensitive and you have to be aware of what those issues are and to take that into consideration. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like a minefield and you have to sort of know where you're going and how you can go there. And, you know, everybody comes to certain issues with a different perspective. And when it comes to religion, you know, for Muslims, it's, it tends to be a bit more sensitive because they come from cultures where, you know, satire about religion has not been a big <laughs> thing in their countries, right? And so when they come here, suddenly it's religious satire. Like, what is happening? Like, what? how did this happen? And it's like, and I didn't realize it until Little Moss actually aired because people, you know, they'll say to me, you're so brave. But the truth is, we'd already made the show. It was already on the air. And, and then people were freaking out. And it was too late to do anything about it. So you can't, you can't be brave retroactively, right? <laughs> so it was like you were kicking people in the teeth without realizing you would kick them in the teeth. And it, you know, to their credit, it took them years to, to get um, desensitized to the fact that they're now going to be objects of, you know. But to be fair, that once, once the, you know, the, the verdict came in, you still maintain that the show's sort of level of satire that you you never you didn't back off of it after all I mean what it sounds like some bullying in in the mosque where mm-hmm. you where you live um, do you not find that um, there's like a little bit of bravery in that well I think what I, what I noticed was that um, we were a moving target right so when a conservative element got angry at one show the next week there'd be another show. And then there'd be another show, and they couldn't quite get. They were still worried, mad about this one. But then <laughs> there'd be this other one. Then there'd be this other one. And then people would kind of like the show, and they're like, "Why aren't you mad about this?" They go, "Yeah, but we really like this one." And so it was uh, this moving target that they couldn't like. If they couldn't fixate on one thing, they couldn't get people. They couldn't get a critical mass of angry people because then that mass was like, "Well, this one was kind of funny. <laughs> I kind of liked him." And then it was sort of snowballing, and then and then slowly the the show started gaining fans in the very group that was not happy with it. And then people were like, ugh, it's no point, right? Because it's just, it's changing too much. And then gradually over the years, we were winning them over. And so now when I go to the mosque, you know, very conservative Muslim men will come to me going, oh, it was so funny, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, ah, and it takes everything I have not to like choke him. I go, because it's so, you know? <laughs> that's not really fair because I don't know if he was upset with it. That's right. It was just maybe sort of a mindset. But now I think it, it took six years, but I think we have more or less, you know, won the community over. Uh, there's a there's a chapter in here uh, about the, the the first reactions that came out about Little Mosque. Uh, do you not find that maybe that uh, committing to uh, the intent of the show to your voice of the show actually helped educate those audiences? That actually um, that there was rough in those first days, uh, but that the show itself allowed uh, its audience to catch up, but 
never to apologize for itself. So it was actually an audience's responsibility to catch themselves up, to to realize that, hey, so <laughs> this is season five. Maybe I need to get on the bus. Uh, do, do you find any element of that? Yeah, it was interesting because when the, the second episode, was it the first or the second episode, Leila got her period and we showed um, blood, you know, in the underwear. And oh my God, like... Um, you know, I would read comments. This is before YouTube, all that stuff became popular. People would just blog and go, I ran screaming from the TV set, right? Because they came from, <laughs> and I was like, really? Because in that culture, it was not talked about, the period and menstruation. It was like very conservative. And so we talked about it openly on the show. And then, you know, feminists came up to me and go, oh, it took a Muslim show to finally show blood on the television. I thought that was really interesting, right? Because meanwhile, well, the Muslims are fleeing, yeah, fleeing, fleeing for the hills. <laughs> So, so I was like dealing with two communities. One was, you know, you're so brave and the ones that were running. And I was like, okay, you know, what, what can you do? And then, so we just went with it, went with it. And then I remember it was third or fourth season. We decided to do an episode where we showed Muslim, uh, the conservative element saying Muslims wouldn't let women go through the front door of the mosque because there would be too, inter too much intermingling between the sexes. And it was like a disco, at the, <laughs> as if it was like a disco at the, at the, op at the doors, right? Because men and women coming through the same doors might result in like, you know, sex or something, right? <laughs> and, so, and so they said, we're going to lock the doors. We're going to say, ban the women from the front. We're gonna, the women are going to go to the bank and we back the doors. And we did an episode about that. And I thought, man, this is going to ruffle feathers, right? So we did this show. And Bobber bans women from the front doors, and the women have to go to the back doors where they have the garbage and stuff. And it came out, and there was like almost silence. Like maybe one or two people reacted, but nothing. Like there was, and I was like, what happened? Like, where are all the mobs with their torches? Like, where are they all? And I realized that they had pretty much got, they had kind of like, ah, you know, whatever. Like, that, that's just the show. And, and I think there was sort of a maturing of the audience at that point where they could roll with it now and they wouldn't have freaked out like they did running, you know, for the hills with the period episode. And so I realized that, wow, we, you know, we can uh, tackle these ex issues that, that are pro problematic in the community without that reaction anymore. People can actually sit there and watch and go, yeah, that happens. It's wrong. We shouldn't do it, <laughs> you know. And there were none of this, why do you have to air our dirty laundry all the time? Like, that was what I got at the beginning. But now... And they've become immune to that. And they're like, okay. Um, that seems to be uh, a concern and a trend that, that tends to happen. Um, that something that is very culturally specific, uh, there's, there's always a group that comes out and says, why, why did you do that to us? Why did you have to air our dirty laundry in front of everyone? Um, I, 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 find, um, I find it perplexing. Um, it's interesting um, to, to see how many fans of Little Moss there are who weren't Muslim. And so I guess my, also my question to you is how, if, if you can answer, uh, how much of the fan base of that show was, was, was non-Muslim? It's a good question. I asked um, the person in the ad department this question, because I don't know if you guys remember, there was a show that came out, I think, a, a year or two years ago called uh, American Muslims, and it was about uh, the Shia Muslim community in Detroit. And it was a reality-based show, and and it didn't last very long, because I think there was um, a guy in Florida who started the Family Florida Association, just one guy, and he, he sort of started this thing about, oh, because uh, it, it was about regular, it was a reality show of regular Muslims playing football and um, just doing ordinary things, and he's like, oh my God, they're whitewashing the American Muslims as normal people so that they can, um, so the terrorists can take over. Something like this, right? And so that people won't recognize them as terrorists. Was it'll be easier TLC? to infiltrate. Yeah, it was on TLC. And he managed to, he managed to get all, you know, Amazon and McDonald's and, and Lowe's to pull out the advertising from the show because they didn't want to be associated with a show that showed Muslims as normal people, right? Because they should only be shown as terrorists. Those are the only Muslims that should be on television because they're... If you show them as regular people, then they might be trustworthy and then might be able to fit in and then they'll fool us into thinking they're, oh yeah. And it, was so, it was so strange. So anyway, that show didn't last very long and I was like so shocked by the reaction. So I went and talked to the ads, ad people in Little Moss. I go, well, what happened to us? Like what was the Canadian reaction? He's like, well, what happens to us is that we track the people who are watching the show and they tended to be um, highly educated. A lot of them were from Calgary for some reason. <laughs> I know. And women, women, the demographic skewed women, highly educated women. And so we ended up selling more ads to luxury products like banks and insurance companies and cars. 
<laughs> and things like that. So we, we, we targeted like those products because of the um, type of demographics we had, which I thought was fascinating, right? The difference between the two countries in terms of how they reacted to two shows. What I, uh, what I find really fascinating is the, uh, the surge of popu uh, popularity with uh, Shahs of Sunset, uh, which if you have not <laughs> watched the show, it is amazing. Uh, it's basically the Kardashians, but with Persians. Uh, and they're not all Muslim, but uh, the viewers, m m for the most part, don't know the difference. Uh, but it's <laughs> fantastic because all they do is buy things in Beverly Hills and have these fabulous lifestyles and then have hookups and like your standard sort of reality TV fare. But this show has taken off and it's also... Um, uh, what's his name? I'm losing, um, I'm losing my mind. Uh, American Idol. American. Uh, sorry? Ryan Seacrest, thank you, Naveen Giren. Uh Ryan Seacrest has produced this show, uh, Shots of Sunset, which you can watch on Omni, and um, you can BitTorrent it, I guess. But uh, you, I, I watch this show, and I, it's bizarre, because it's, it's wrapped in this sort of, we're Persian, we're different kinds of Persian, like some of us are Christian, there's like a, like the, the knowledge network portion, which is like 15 seconds, and then the rest of the shows, they just buy Chanel things, and they buy like a lot of money, and that what it's actually offered, uh, which Americans are really familiar with, is capitalism. So it's, it's like an, a 45-minute show basically about like buying things, but not at Walmart, uh, at, the, at, at, at places that we all covet to buy. Uh, that, that in its own small way, despite its superficiality, is actually helping propel the, uh, the branding of uh, people of color, particularly of, of a nation that... Yeah, it's been demonized. Might be Muslim. Yeah, well, that's, that's incredible. So they they beat the guy from the Family Florida Association, right? Mm -hmm. So they're gonna they are taking over the Western world, and they're gonna really? yeah, they're gonna take um, over. To to loop back to this conversation about criticism, um, we were we were talking in the green room a little bit about your family's reaction uh, to the book. Uh, uh, can you tell me a bit about uh, what your kids said when oh, they yeah. read a draft of the book? Oh yeah, I was so worried book? about the book because my eldest daughter was like, "Well, if I wasn't your daughter, I would never read a book like this." <laughs> and, I, and and she and then so she read it and she was you know she was okay with it. My second daughter was like, "Meh, I could do a better job, right?" <laughs> and my son was my son was like really like I, he's in there and he got circumcised in the book and he's like, w "So how am I in there?" I'm like, oh, he goes and he's very you know he's a teenager so he's he, that's where they're the most embarrassed by their mother. And so he feels utterly humiliated that the only reference that he's in there is when he gets circumcised. So he's, he's just like, can, can, hopefully he's hoping the book doesn't get to his teenage friend. He won't catch, on, he won't catch on among high school because then they'll realize that he's in there as the <laughs> circumcised boy. Because there's a thing where, you know, when he's, he's, when, um, the comedy of his birth is that he was my first boy. And when I looked at his penis, I said to my husband, oh, my God, he's deformed. And, <laughs> And my husband looked at me and said, that is what an uncircumcised penis looked like. And I was like, well, how am I supposed to know, right? Because every penis in my life has been circumcised, right? So I... And so, and my son here, who's the youngest, he feels the book picked up when he was born. And he, he recommends the chapters onward from that point. <laughs> Those are his favorite chapters. So he's the true fan, I think. Yeah. And the true, true star of yeah. the book. Uh, you speak a lot about your sort of ongoing, challenging relationship with your mother, which yes. is something that I have also written about. We've we figured it out, mother. Um, I'd. What was her reaction? I was so afraid. I didn't want her to read it. Everyone's been asking me that, but she managed to get a copy at the launch. <laughs> so I actually hid the the, the previous issue. Um, I, when Mesa, I sent her the paperback edition when, they, when, they, when it first comes out, the, um, the, unedited, the unedited manuscript, and she had read it, and I said, hide it from Nani. Don't let her see it, <laughs> whatever you do. Because she, uh, my daughter goes to school at McMaster and visits my mom on the weekends when my parents live in Oakville, Ontario. And so I kept it hidden from her, but at the book launch, I don't know, she must have bought a copy. I don't know how she got a hold of it, but she got a hold of it, and she read the whole thing, and she just looked at me. She goes, you know, it's funny. You remember things differently than I remember things, right? And... <laughs> And I was like, yeah, this yeah. This is I, all ringing very true yeah. in my household. <clears throat> and she was very diplomatic. She didn't, um, 
criticize me or say anything, you know, which I was really scared and quite worried about and didn't want her to read. There was a chapter in this book, I kid you not, I won um, an award from journalism school. Like, it w I was at Ryerson Journalism School, and there's this one award for broadcast radio, and I won it in Stuart McLean's class. And, I w you know, we went for the ceremony. The photographer wanted to take a picture of myself and Stuart McLean standing side by side, and my mom taps me on the shoulder. <laughs> And I'm like, Mom, you can't be in this picture. And she's like, neither can you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, if a picture with you and a white man gets out, people, no one will want to marry you. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, you can't be serious, right? You just can't be serious. And she's like, yes, I am. And so they had to put someone else in her place. And it was like the most humiliating thing in my whole life, right? I was just like, I was like, I can't, like I would rage about this to my husband. He's like, you know what? You need to write about this so we can stop hearing about this all the time, right? And I waited for 20 years when Stuart McLean came back to Regina. He was doing his Christmas show. And I, I managed to argue and fight my way to the green room at the back. And I said, come here, Stuart. And I took the selfie with me, with my arm around him. And I took a picture of Stuart. And I waited till I got home. I said, look. I have a picture of Stuart McLean, and I'm still married, and it didn't affect my life. And, and my mom is like, what's wrong with you? You're crazy. Like, <laughs> she didn't even remember, right? And, and it, you realize at that time, like, you, you, you hang on to this stuff, and it has such a hold on your psyche, and you're just like, ah. And, and, and they don't even remember, right? She was just like, oh, you know, it was your father. It was, he was so crazy. It was just because of your father, right? I find that so true, though. Like we, we, we hold on to these things. These like, and they shape us. They, you know, yeah. like twenty years. That, <laughs> you hang that, on to that, that stuff. That makes you yeah. who you are. Yeah. And to suddenly have a parent say, "Oh, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, oh. yeah, but fine. But, like, <laughs> why, why did you? Why does that bother you so much? Why yeah. are you thinking like, you, you should let it go? Yeah, go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst. You to should have let a it go. Parent actually say, "You should really let, let, let that go, go now." Like, I know. I know. Right. <laughs> It's like the ultimate, and so then you can then you have to write about it just so that you can finally let it go. Exactly, that's actually the process of because you want go. everyone to say, "Wasn't that crazy? Wasn't that crazy what she did?" Right? And it's in it's. I mean, it's infuriating when someone actually says, "Well, I guess," <laughs> because it'll never reach that sort of zenith point of outrage that you feel. And you've, I mean, it's just gotten worse over twenty years, much like my my own with yeah. Little Mosque on the Prairie. Yes, yes. Um, I'm reconciling. I'm reconciling. Right, this you talk have to write has about really it. Helped. Write a chapter. Yeah. You got to write yeah. a book. Get it out. <laughs> uh, I I have been hogging uh, Zerka for the last hour, uh, and as many of you know, uh, this is the month of Ramadan, and uh, Zerka will be breaking fast oh, very yes. soon. So we are now going to move on to. The the audience participation uh, uh, segment of our evening, uh, where you may ask Zarka all your burning, dying questions. Uh, we, we, we ask that we uh, leave Islam uh, out, out of tonight's uh, evening. Uh, Zarka is not responsible for all the happenings of Islam. Uh, so uh, any yes. burning questions to Zarka, not Islam, uh, fire away. Yes. Uh, do we Can have a mic? Uh, do we? Okay. Fantastic. We have a question right down in the front here. Do you have a friend with a mic? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. My question is your experience with First Nations people. Have you? How, when was your first contact with First Nations? Was you know, it's, it, it's interesting then? that you ask that because and I grew up in Ontario and I did not have I, was any contact with First Nations. And then I moved to Saskatchewan and it was, inc it was like the learning curve was just incredible. Like my daughter is taking courses at the First Nations University and it's, you know, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that how little I knew about the First Nations community and what they've gone through. Like, and I'm complaining about my picture with Stuart McLean, right? Like, it's just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, um, what the First Nations community has gone through and continues to go through, yeah. and what I'm learning and making friends and friendships and alliances. Um, it's it's been incredible experience in Saskatchewan. And do you have any plans to make a film or a comedy show with the First Nations comedians? I would leave that to the First Nations people. I feel that they've actually been the pioneers of comedy. Um, and they've done incredible work in t television and radio. Incredible work. 
you have any other questions? Ah, we have a friend in the front. I would like to know if you have any intention or plan to maybe create another television series or maybe a set of books or CDs or a movie based on your work? <laughs> it's a good question. My agent has the same question for me too. <laughs> What is next? And you're like, oh my God, I just finished the book. Um, t making, tele making a television show is incredibly difficult. You have to go through incredible hoops. Um, you know, we, I was very fortunate that I literally lucked into a successful first show because that is not the traditional trajectory of a television writer. They usually suffer for years and years and years writing other people's shows before they get a chance to make their own show. And I have learned that now that I've had the successful show, I'm now in that trajectory where you're <laughs> trying to pitch and sell shows. I've, d I, I've pitched and sold pilots um, to U.S. networks, but it's like a, literally a 99.9% .9 failure rate because what happened, not just for me, <laughs> but for the industry, because what happens is they buy, the American networks buy like 150 scripts, you know, and then maybe they'll shoot three or four pilots and maybe they'll test them and then maybe one will go, and then maybe that one, one or two, will, you know, it'll fail. So it, you, you see it every fall. You'll see all these shows come out, and then, you know, it, it's such, like, you know, incredible. The odds are, are against you when it comes to making television. And so what ended up happening was I made, like, I, you know, I wrote four great pilots, and when they died, the, the networks owned those pilots, right? Because they paid for them, and then they just sit on them, and that's the end. And so and no one gets to read them or hear from them. So what I wanted to do was write a book, because then at least if the book never gets made into a TV series, it still exists as a thing that you can share with the world. So I think I'm going to try a different tact, where instead of you know, writing a pilot and then it disappears forever and then you can't really tell anyone. Because I can sit, sit here and tell you guys, I wrote four great pilots, but you'll never be able to read them because they're owned by the networks. Whereas I think what I'm going to start doing is writing books that can be made into TV series. And so if they're not made into TV series, they still exist in story form. And mm -hmm. Because I feel that when you write a story, it, it has this life and it, it deserves to be read and seen by people. And that's the thing about publishing. So has, uh, has you know, your first... Uh, launched book has that uh, created a, a a new craving to it does to, it, to it's write a different books? it's a different genre I mean television is much more you know it, there's only so much you can tell in a television show like it's you're limited just because of well, the, the amount material. of minutes you have yeah well, you know you can't go inside their heads you can't go internal you can't have internal con well I guess you could with you know um, talking out loud but I feel with writing, there's, um, you can go deeper into a character, and literature is um, a more nuanced form of writing. So I'm, I'm exploring the idea of writing more, maybe um, like novels, co comedic novels. You also have a different relationship with audience in that way, that there's actually a, a far more direct route to your audience when you, the writer, uh, uh, exist as the writer. It's not like you're, you know, you're writing through Amar or through Baba or Rayan, uh, that that there's no pretense that you've written the book, this is your voice, and so the audience then feels like they have an access point to you. Uh, there's, there's, something, there's something about yeah. that. They, they can find you through the book. It's true. I mean, I, I feel it's interesting because I never thought that a book would engage people in, in the way that it has. And I've been quite honored by the way that people have been reading it and telling me that it reflects their story and, and it's been so relatable and <sighs> universal. <laughs> <laughs> And it's been fantastic. I've been, you know, I, I didn't think that the reaction would be so strong to this book as it has been. And we also think, you know, the um, that our attention spans are so short now because of this digital age that we 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 accept our information in sort of short snippets that we 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 need it to be very fast. And so um, uh, there's a there's a feeling that you know maybe reading is going out of style, but uh, people are loving the book. And I, I actually think. Uh, I think more books like this will actually, uh, you know, bring back reading, <laughs> like I hope a lot. So. I hope so. And I think it's an advantage, and you must realize this, writing comedy, people enjoy, you know, laughing and relaxing and reading something that's fun and light and not as heavy. And so it makes reading more enjoyable. And I feel that it was, I was really fortunate to be able to write my first book as a comedy because it helped engage people with the, with the storytelling, mm. especially when it's about, you know, a culture and a faith that's very could be very different from them. So I felt that the comedy was a way into a sort of a different world, and it, it helped people. Fantastic. We have another question down in the front. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, something that um, 
you talked about very briefly in the very beginning, you touched on the fact that you have four children. I do. Okay. So how did you do this? How do you balance How do you balance all children? Of this? Children, a book, the TV show, everything. You know what? There's no easy answer. Um, I would say that you have to... I had a very supportive partner. Very, very supportive. My husband was... He recognized that desire in me to write and that creativity, and he... You know, he was extremely supportive and encouraged me and never let me... Cause it, because when you have children, it's so easy, especially when they're little babies, just to say, I'm just not, I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to do writing for a while. I'm just going to put things on hold. And, and you can kind of lose yourself in motherhood because it is so all-encompassing. Like, it's you could, you know, literally, you know, do it full-time. Like it's like having two full-time jobs. But he was always like, no, you know, you have to make time. You can't give up. You can't, you know, you have the skill... Um, and his desire, and he was, and I was the one pushing, I want another baby. He's like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure we should have another one? <laughs> and so I would sort of be this crazy scheduler where I would put them to bed at like six. He'd come home from work, and he'd like, where are they? I'm like, oh, they're all sleeping, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then I would like, I would be writing like crazy, and then, but except I'd get up at like four, right? Four, because they've had their, you know, so then it would ba backfire. So I would try to find ways to, um, I was a big believer in child care, big believer, right, which bothered my mom because she w came from the world of you should stay home and mother should 100%, and, but I couldn't do that. It was just too hard, and so um, I would take them to day homes and daycares, and I would realize that it was good for the two of us to have time apart, and I would use that time to write and to find um, the projects in me, and, I, and, and that's what I tell people who want to write. You have to be incredibly self-motivated because nobody is going to give you the job. You have to create your own job. So I would do it between nap time, and in a way it worked with motherhood because I was home, and I would write during nap time. I would write at night. I would put them in daycare, and I would write while they were gone, and it made you incredibly efficient, right? By the time the last one, he's sitting there, was in grade one, the school bus would come and take all four of them away. And I knew literally, I, you know, people talk about writer's block. You can't afford to have writer's block. You had till the school bus picked them up, till the school bus brought them back. That was it. That was all you had, right? And so I'd be furiously writing, furiously writing, because I knew that was it. I wouldn't, you know, you'd read about, you know, Ernest Hemingway. Oh, I'd have coffee, and I'd smoke, and then two in the afternoon, I would write, and then I would put it down. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? No, <laughs> there was no coffee. There was no smoking. There was no eating. There was no drinking. There was just writing. Like you, and so, you became, so being a mother... Was was it, it, it ended up making me very efficient as a writer because you were so desperate for those hours that you could write, and they were so few and so precious. And they would, once they were gone, they would evaporate. Once they were home, they would like, eat your brain and, and alive, right? And so, so I learned to become very, very, very efficient between their schedules. And so it was between having a very, you know, a supportive partner, believing that there's nothing wrong with childcare, not feeling guilty about daycares. They're, they're a woman's friend, you know, use them. Um, and, and just being incredibly driven and self-motivated because you have to be in this business because no one's going to give you um, those opportunities. You have to create them for yourself, which is why I tell my kids, go to med school. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much easier. <laughs> Sorry, you had a question? Is that CBC telling you to do this, or was that... Uh, yeah, it was called product placement. Product placement, yes. yeah. Because so like, they were paying for a certain... They would pay for a certain amount of that episode. Yeah, and so, like, was... As a writer... As a writer, we hated it. We absolutely okay. hated it, and we bristled at it. But now that I look back, I'm like, oh, my God, like, you know, like... I should be so grateful that a product wanted to be in a show and associated with Muslim and Islam because it had it been in the U.S., they were pulling their products out and, the, and, and, and they couldn't afford to make the show. Um, so at the time, I was really, you know, we were like, oh, this is terrible, we're selling our souls. But now, looking back, I'm, I'm so grateful that they wanted to be associated with the show because it could have gone um, so many other horrible ways. Yeah. Okay, so like, uh, um, if, you, if you put your foot down and said, no, I am not doing this, that would they have listened have to me? No. <laughs> they wouldn't have listened. Yeah, okay. I don't, no, I wouldn't have had that power to say no, okay. for sure. Yeah. And that's, a, that's sort of a reality, not just in Canada, but... Uh, it's an economic everywhere. reality. Everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, even those, like, uh, those mother-in-law, daughter-in-law soap serials in India... Uh, like you're still, <laughs> you know, like Janachur. Yeah, Janachur. And was, Hajmula. The, the washing powder that you should exactly, use. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it's yeah. the reality of the economy, yeah. Absolutely. I don't, I, uh, I, I think 
we don't know a world now with uh, even television and film without branding. Yeah. Uh, it pays the bills for sure. Uh, I, I saw a hand uh, right there. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the TV show and your book and for coming here. It's so evident that you're a really funny person and also a really fearless person. And I was just wondering, um, you know, there are outside influences or someone in your family or something within you that really keeps you true to who you are and just fearless? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think back, like, what what drove me to comedy and writing. I think that I probably was a very creative person but didn't know it because I was too busy taking physics and organic chemistry and calculus and things I, that were not easy to do for me with the way that I, my brain was wired. And, but I felt I had to finish the four-year degree because I had started it. And who wants to abandon a degree and then not have it? You know, that's the dilemma. Like if you got two or three years and if you stop, then you lose those three years. So I'm like, just do it, just get through it and then we'll sort ourselves out. Um, and then I went to Ryerson for journalism, and that's when I realized that I had this sort of innate creativity in me, and I did journalism. And, and when people say you're bored with journalism, what I actually mean by being bored with journalism was that I was writing other people's stories. I, do, do you guys know Peter Zosky from Morningside? So I was working for his show, and he was this incredible man who would, who would take all this research that we would do and all the questions that we'd, we would do, um, we would interview people, and then he and he would take all this stuff and he would make magic on air and he was having the most fun, and I kind of felt like I'm not having fun <laughs> doing this and I'm missing something and what is that thing that I'm missing and there it was that storytelling element I didn't know it at the time but I was missing writing story and then I made my first film Barbecue Muslims and I realized that I got the most enjoyment from combining comedy and story and spinning tales that were fusing. Um, and now I realize what I was fusing. I, ha I read um, someone's Little Mosque in the Prairie uh, uh, resulted in a lot of PhD dissertations <laughs> out there. And I was actually reading a paper before I came. One of the professors sent me a piece of paper, and I was just reading it. And it was incredible because he was saying, well, this show took Canadian culture and Islamic culture and fused them together and created this new kind of culture and a new identity. And, you know, the show was a metaphor for this, this, and this. I had no idea, right, that this was happening. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> it's like... Because, you know, that's the thing that you don't want to analyze it too much because I'm glad I read this paper after the show was over because it would have freaked the crap out of me <laughs> if, I, if I had read it before. Because, you know, he was saying, well, she did this because it was, you know, she put a, a mosque in a church because it was a metaphor. for the, you know, And I was like, I, you know, because in my mind it wasn't a metaphor. It was just we had mosques and churches. That's just the way it was because Muslims couldn't afford mosques so they would just have them in churches, right? And so, but he analyzed this in, in this way and and you realize, wow, like it can you can make a show and it could reverberate in so many different ways for so many different people and so, you know, angles, especially for academia, it seems. <laughs> the boom uh, for we should also mention that uh, two of the actors from Little Mosque are actually here with us in the audience. Potentially three. Is Vina here too? Is, is, can you guys stand up and be acknowledged, please? There's a Minaj and Aliza and Vina from Little Mosque in the Prairie. Isn't that great? You guys are here. <laughs> That is so, so fantastic. Thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, we are, we are, you know, we're, we're, we're nearing your... Uh, yes, I need to eat. Yeah, what, Zane, so what time is it? Is it time? <laughs> what did you say? He's just checking. We're his. checking on time. <laughs> so what, we'll take one last question, and then we're going to let Zarka eat. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Can we have a taste of the book? Can you have a taste of the book? Oh, did you want me to read the you want me to read the back of it? How about read the back? <laughs> in your own voice? It'll be like an audio book. Covered a little more. Does anyone have the hard copy? Can I read the Yeah, I was going to say it's not in that one. They excerpt this um, This is me at school when I'm trying to um, make friends and I'm having a hard time. And I had to ask my mom to come with me. <laughs> My mom didn't remember this incident. I actually remembered this. So my, I, I said to my mom, nobody wants to play with me at school. And she's like, really? And I was like, yeah. She goes, well, I'll come with you, which is like horrifying, right? Your Indian mom in her shalvar kameez <laughs> comes with you to school to help you make friends. And so, and Kathleen was this white girl that I idolized. So Kathleen looked first at my mother and then at me. She was momentarily confused by the odd scene of a sad, petulant child wearing a summer dress with brown corduroy pants in the radiating heat, sporting braids that went out of style a hundred years ago. 
standing beside a large Pakistani woman wearing a long shirt and baggy pantaloons that ballooned like sails in the wind. My mother looked like a pirate and I, her oppressed first mate. <laughs> My stomach growled as I mouthed a silent, player, a silent prayer, God, please kill me now. <laughs> but I lived and Kathleen finally made up her mind. Sure, she can play, said Kathleen, and handed me the rope so I could take over. My mother went home. From that day forward, I always played jump rope with the popular girls. Turns out that skipping rope on the playground was a mediocrity. So as long as my wrists still worked, I was allowed into their circle, even if I was dressed for the wrong century. <laughs> Apparently, all I had to do was ask, and yes, I was thankful to God, who clearly worked in mysterious ways. Uh, so on that note, uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna call this a night. You're we gonna are. eat some food. I'm gonna eat. I'll be there. Yes, signing books. Uh, but yeah. Zarka will be uh, signing uh, copies of her book, so you can find those out those doors. Get a copy if you don't already have one. Uh, get it signed by Zarka. Maybe you'll get a dal stain <laughs> on it. It'll be like a fingerprint. Yeah, there'll be curry stains on the book. Exactly. That might It'll be this authentically. Is... You know, Indian. <laughs> uh, so I'd like Good to time. wrap up this I, I evening in a in in the most digital way that I can possibly think of by taking a selfie on oh. stage. So you guys can all watch us take a selfie okay. on stage. Uh, this, is awesome. this is very exciting. This is. Is it working? Yes. Oh, we're we gonna just it. turn. We, we gotta reverse it. Guys. Sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Your arms long enough. Just. There we go. You guys have been a great audience. Uh, thanks for uh, sticking around for our conversation. Uh, Zaka, it's such a pleasure.